extreme droughts and flooding in India, a heat wave in Europe, and security threat warnings in the United States. But are big polluters ignoring the climate crisis and the risks it poses to their countries and the world at large? Hello and welcome to Bigger Than Five with me, Rida Fakhri. When U.S. President Donald Trump gave a speech last week on, quote, America's environmental leadership, he did not mention climate change, touting instead what he called America's clean air and clean water. But the U.S.'s carbon dioxide emissions make it the leading polluter per capita among the world's largest economies. Global emissions are also on the rise, prompting the United Nations to warn about what it calls the risks of climate apartheid, where the wealthy pay to escape the devastating consequences of climate change, leaving the poor to suffer. Here in the United States, the Pentagon says climate change poses, quote, immediate risks to national security at a time when the Trump administration continues to roll back climate regulations. Democrats introduced a resolution in Congress last week to declare it a national emergency. In Australia, meanwhile, newly released documents show that the country's defense forces are also concerned about the risk of conflict and an influx of climate refugees. The UN says there is a climate crisis disaster once a week. One of these crises has hit India's sixth largest city. Chennai is nearly out of water. A satellite image from NASA shows the city's primary reservoir has almost completely dried up in just one year. We visited the city of 8 million to see how people there are coping with the water shortage. விவசாயி <laughs> The primary problem over here is not a problem of water crisis, but a problem of people losing their connection with nature. The government is saying, don't worry about your water body. We will supply water from Karnataka. We will supply water from a different state. And so when that happens, then the relationship with your natural surroundings declines and you start abusing it. Chennai's known for its water problem, from primarily from the time it became a city. And from the time that it became difficult for us to steal or take water from distant places. We have treated our land badly. And we have covered up all open spaces with concrete and asphalt. And we call this development. And as a result of that, we are having to face a variety of problems. Flooding when it rains heavily, and no water when there's no rains. போன வருஷமும் மழை இல்லை அதுக்கு முந்தின வருஷமும் மழை இல்லை அதுக்கு முந்தின வருஷம் வந்து ரெண்டாயிரத்தி பதினஞ்சில் வந்த மழை எங்களுக்கு இது இல்லை ரெண்டாயிரத்தி பதினஞ்சில் வந்தால் தண்ணி எங்களுக்கு நிற்கல அது எல்லாமே போயிடுச்சு எங்களுக்கு அந்த கிளைமேட்டு மாறினால் மழை தண்ணி பிரச்சனை எங்களுக்கு இருந்து தான் இருக்குது பாசன தண்ணி இல்லாமல் அந்த பாதி வேலையை விட்டுட்டோம் இப்போ கொஞ்சம் வேலை தான் செய்யணும் கொஞ்சம் தண்ணி கிடைக்குது அதுக்கு தகுந்த மாதிரி வேலை செய்கிறோம் இப்போ போகும்போது பார்ப்பா தான் குளம் கூட வச்சுன்னு அங்கே போராட்டம் பண்ணுவாங்க வெளியில் ரோட்டில் அதெல்லாம் பார்த்துக்கலாம் நாங்களும் நிறைய ஆஃபீஸ்லாம் போவோம் கும்பலாக போவோம் பெரிய அனுப்பணும்னு சொல்லுவாங்க அவ்வளோதான் வாட்டர் கிரைசிஸ் காசஸ் அ கான்ஃப்ளிக்ட் இன் தமிழ்நாடு வர்ச்சுவலி எவ்ரி அதர் இயர் திஸ் இயர் இஃப் த மான்சூன்ஸ் ஃபெயில் வி வில் சி தமிழ்நாடு அண்ட் கர்நாடகா த டூ டூ ஸ்டேட்ஸ் தட் ஷேர் த வாட்டர் ஃப்ரம் காவேரி அ மேஜர் ரிவர் தட் வில் இராப்ட் இன் கான்ஃப்ளிக் பஸ்ஸஸ் வில் பி பர்ன் தெல் பி ஃபைட்ஸ் பிட்வீன் த டூ ஸ்டேட்ஸ் ஆஃப் இந்தியா I think that the entire disaster can squarely be laid at the doors of the industrialized countries because 
they have created this climate monster and this climate monster is preventing us or not giving any options for people in the developing world to experiment with different technologies there is no time And so with many developing nations already experiencing the severe impact of the climate crisis, what should countries responsible for the majority of fossil fuel emissions do to help the most vulnerable? To discuss, I'm joined by Myron Ebel, who calls himself the number one enemy of climate change alarmism. He led President Donald Trump's transition team for the Environmental Protection Agency and is director of the Center for Energy and Environment at the Competitive Enterprise Institute here in Washington, D.C. Myron Ebel, the evidence is there. You just saw some of the evidence. Extreme droughts, flash floods, not just in India, but across many parts of the developing world. The United Nations today warns that in just about 10 years' time from now, 120 million people could be pushed into poverty. And that includes millions of people in wealthier nations like the United States. Yet you continue to say there is no crisis, there is no emergency. Bad weather is not climate change. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, we all have to live with bad weather no, no matter where we live in the world. Some places have much more bad weather than others. Uh, India, for example, has seasons, uh, long periods of droughts and long periods of too much rain. Uh, we have uh, uh, all kinds of bad weather around the world, but that doesn't mean that there's a climate crisis. Sure, but, but on a serious note, this goes well beyond bad weather, doesn't it? The 20 warmest years have actually occurred in the 22 last years alone. The last mm -hmm. four years on record have been the hottest, and that is according to the World Meteorological Organization. Your own government's national climate assessment says that U.S. coastal cities are now five to ten times more likely than they used to be to face daily tidal flooding. Can you deny this evidence? Well, what do you think uh, uh, is causes sea level rise? The seas have been rising since the end of the last ice age, 12 or 13,000 years ago. They will continue rising until the next ice age begins. Now that's a true climate crisis when the next ice age begins. This sounds like classic political spin, talking points that you and others like you have employed for years, if not decades, to try to undermine the scientific consensus. Just take your own government's national climate assessment, the latest in 2018. This is what it found, that continued growth in carbon emissions over the century and beyond will lead to atmospheric CO2 concentrations not experienced in tens to hundreds of millions of years. Is this alarmist? Are your government scientific experts and advisors simply making this stuff up? Uh, there are uh, numerous scenarios in the fourth national climate assessment and the authors of it decided to use the most extreme scenario. That scenario assumes that we're going to go back to using coal. Do you believe that? No, of course not. Uh, we are not going back to coal, we're moving away from coal. The whole world is moving away from coal. So emissions are not going to be nearly as high as that scenario predicts. You say this, yet, you do not come from a scientific background. You accuse climate scientists, meanwhile, of exaggerating the implications of climate change for their own gain. What drives your position is what I'd like to know, because you've referred to the scientists as a climate industrial complex and one of the most dangerous threats to society. But isn't your position, in fact, driven by financial gain? Because no. according to conservative transparency, ExxonMobil gave your organization, the CEI, $1.69 million between 2001 and 2005. And it's well established that one of the organizations that you helped set up actually received more than $11 million in donations over the years from coal and oil companies. And the list of fossil fuel companies, including the leading coal and oil companies in this country, Marathon Petroleum, Murray Energy Corp, have given to your annual gala, including the latest in 2019, huge sums of money. Well, huge sums of money. Uh, the CEI has an annual budget of $7 million. About one third to one quarter of that goes to our energy and environment program. Uh, the, the organizations that we're up against, uh, if you just take the top 10, their annual budget is over $1 billion a year. The Sierra Club is over $100 million. The Natural Resources Defense Council is over $100 million. 
the Worldwide Fund for Nature is over 100 million. Still, but so, this raises see, an important so, conflict so, of interest, doesn't it? No, what, yes, they have they have a huge no, no, they have a huge position, financial in interest position, in taking pushing so much, alarmism. No, in, in pushing alarmism and taking so much money from leading oil and coal companies. Oh, but, but the major oil companies are now supporting the environmental pressure groups. They're supporting carbon taxes. Exxon Mobil is giving more per year than they gave CEI over the entire course of giving money to CEI. They're giving more money per year to lobby for carbon taxes right now. So who's making a no, fortune and off yet, of that? And yet what these companies are interested in doing is creating doubt over climate science so that they can continue getting the staggering amounts of uh, subsidies that they get. The IMF just the other day released information mm -hmm. saying that subsidies for coal, oil and gas in the United States reached $649 billion in 2015. That is That's 10 ridiculous. times That's the ridiculous. amount Congress they don't, they gives, don't, no, they gives, don't, no, that's gives ridiculous. schools for education, and that no, is more no. than the Pentagon spending the, for that year. That's ridiculous. That's exactly the fact. That's, no, that is not a fact. Well, you go back to the Look, IMF. I'll tell you where the oil subsidies are. The oil subsidies are in countries that are petrostates. So countries that have a lot of oil, like Saudi Arabia, they subsidize the price of gasoline for their citizens. Uh, that's where the subsidies are. Uh, in this country, what we have large subsidies for is the renewable energy, solar, wind, ethanol, uh, and uh, that's where the, the bulk of the taxpayer subsidies are. Uh, the IMF, I don't know where you get this IMF From stuff. The IMF. It's completely these, nutty. These, these it's just totally released. nutty. And this is uh, something that uh, the IMF uh, chief, in fact, just said. She said, removing fossil fuel subsidies is the right way to go because these subsidies have cost every person in the US more than $2,000 a year. You've also accused climate scientists of peddling their own alarmist political agenda Hasn't this administration actually pushed its own political purposes by censoring some key bits of information that show the negative impact of climate change? Well, what do you have? Let me give you examples. Example. Yes. It's removed important data from the EPA's website. We know that. It's refused to publicize dozens of government funded studies about the negative effects of climate change. Mm -hmm. And just last week, a State Department analyst was not, a, not allowed to testify to Congress about climate change and its impact by the EPA and had to resign. Uh, well, I've had experience of many administrations and I think that this administration is doing uh, a much better job of, of giving the science straight than some previous administrations. Every administration tries to discipline its the career professional workforce to make sure that they're on board with the policies of the administration. But I find much less sense censorship of science in the, in the Trump administration than I do, for example, uh, going back to the Clinton administration is a good example. But how can you say that when you yourself pushed for a 31% cut in the EPA budget and getting rid of at least 3,800 employees saying, let's reduce the regulators. How can you say that this uh, administration has done anything productive on this? Re regulators are not scientists by and large, and they don't do science, they regulate. The problem with the US economy is we are so overregulated that it is a tremendous drag on economic prosperity, uh, particularly for the poorest people in the country who, who bear the brunt of these of the overregulation that the EPA does. So the only way we're ever gonna have less regulation and get out from under the burden of, the, of the, the bureaucratic state is if we have a smaller EPA. And in fact, the EPA has accomplished most of its mission when it was established in 1970 to clean up the air, the land, and the water. We have the cleanest air in the world. We have the cleanest water in the world. And uh, we're finally, under the Trump administration, making some progress in cleaning up toxic waste sites on the land. And, and so, you have rolled back many of the Obama administration regulations, which would have put yes, a stop thank God. to the nonstop drilling that goes on in public lands, which is the opposite of what President Trump and you are just suggesting now about uh, keeping the air clean and the water clean. And as we speak, uh, the president is contemplating making the entire U.S. shore open to oil drilling. How exactly does that make, well, uh, make your case? The United States is now, as a result of the shale oil and gas revolution, we are now the world's largest producer of oil and of natural gas. We are the world's energy superpower. This is tremendously good for the United States and it's tremendously good for the world. It's enriching the United States. It's giving us a huge energy price advantage Manufacturing is flowing back into this country. Working class wages are going up for the first time in 20 years. People are better off. Uh, 
because we have abundant, affordable energy in this country, and, this is again, and, again, we, and again. we are helping reduce the the power of Russia and the petro states to 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 manipulate the world economy. Again, you're deflecting, but again, isn't this a, a classic example of putting the interests of corporate America first? President Trump recently, quite ironically, in fact, talked about America's environmental leadership standing right next to two lobbyists. One, a former coal lobbyist who runs the EPA, another, the Interior Secretary, who's a former oil lobbyist. Isn't there more than just a bit of irony? Here? What bothers me is when, when a president stands next to a bunch of environmental pressure group leaders who want to shut down the economy and impoverish people around the world. We'll have to leave it there. Myron Bell of the Competitive Enterprise Institute, thank you very much. So the debate over how to solve the climate crisis can get heated. But the fact is, 2018 was the fourth warmest year on record. If we want to prevent the world from warming more than 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2030, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says global greenhouse gas emissions would need to fall by 45% from 2010 levels. Katie Fisher has this week's five facts. Despite knowing about climate change, we're still polluting. Greenhouse gas emissions rose 1.7% in 2018. That's 70% higher than the average increase since 2010. China, India, and the United States accounted for 85% of the increase in emissions, while total emissions decreased in Germany, Japan, Mexico, France, and the United Kingdom. Developed nations have been slow to help poorer countries combat climate change. In 2009, rich nations vowed to help mobilize $100 billion annually by 2020 to help developing countries deal with climate change. As of 2016, they were about halfway there. A portion of that funding is intended to go toward the Green Climate Fund, but only half the pledge funds have actually been committed. Sweden would be the biggest investor per capita, and with President Trump's decision to stop payments to the fund, the commitment of the U.S. could drop to just $3 per person. Inequality has grown because of climate change. Between 1961 and 2010, the gap between the rich and poor grew 25% wider than it would have been without climate change. And nature is in trouble. Global populations of vertebrates have declined 60% over 40 years. One million plant and animal species are on the verge of extinction. If we don't address climate change, we're in for more trouble. 99% of corals could disappear. 100 million more people could be living in extreme poverty. More than a thousand islands could become uninhabitable. And the cost of inaction is estimated at more than $50 trillion. So inaction can be costly and potentially deadly. Climate change is considered a threat multiplier on already stressed societies. If the current trends continue, could conflicts become even more likely? I'm joined by Rebecca Carter, Deputy Director of the Climate Resilience Practice at the World Resources Institute, and Francesco Femia, co-founder of the Center for Climate and Security here in Washington. Welcome to you both. Rebecca Carter, there are still those who deny the impact of climate change or that it has a potentially strong link with conflict and wars. What does your research tell you? Our research and the research of many other organizations tells us that climate impacts are becoming more and more severe. We're seeing them in more and more places every day. The evidence just keeps getting stronger. Just as an example that ties, I think, quite directly to conflict, um, the, world, the Food and Agriculture Organization just released its third report that shows us that for three years in a row, global food security is declining. So there are more hungry people in the world. And they say that climate change is a major reason for that. And I think it's pretty easy to see that hungry people are more likely to engage in conflict. When people are desperate, they're forced into situations where maybe they have to migrate, they have fewer options. So the scarcity of resources, including the scarcity of water, Francesco Femia, for years we've been hearing that conflicts like those in South Sudan, in Niger, in the Lake Chad region, even Syria could trace its roots back to to climate change because it came on the heel of the longest period of excessive and extreme drought. How definitive though a link is there? Well, first of all, I think it's really important to understand that climate change is, has rarely, if ever, been the primary cause of an armed conflict. And I think that's important to note, not just because I think that's true, but also because you never want to give, you know, sort of 
you know, those who are responsible for dealing with their own countries, a particular uh, uh, ruler in power or a regime, um, you don't want to let them off the hook. It's really ultimately their responsibility to manage their resources in a way that uh, helps avoid conflict. Um, but uh, there has been growing evidence over the past few years that there is a, a connection between climate change and conflict uh, in a number of different situations around the world and different countries around the world. Uh, particularly in 2016, I think one of the most important studies released by the Potsdam Institute showed that there is an increased likelihood of armed conflict in the wake of natural disasters that are climate exacerbated uh, in countries that are et ethnically fractionalized, where there's already sort of tension and or conflict between different sectors organizations and so I think that's um, that's quite good and yet quite some compelling. cases are more obvious than others uh, the Syrian case may be not as obvious to many but in the case of Yemen a lot of estimates now suggesting that the water scarcity could lead the capital Sana'a and its four million inhabitants to become water refugees by the year 2025 how serious an issue is it for them there I would consider it incredibly serious. I mean, they honestly are about at the end of the road. They have very few options. And it is when people are left without choices, left without good plan Bs, that conflict becomes more likely. What about the non-state actors, Francesco Femia, that could actually exploit this sort of situation? Uh, we know some have drawn a link between climate change and the rise of extremist groups uh, like ISIS because they are very adept at exploiting this loophole and using it as a weapon. What we're seeing more and more of now is that as water stresses become more severe, uh, that non-state actors like ISIS in Iraq, for example, with the Mosul Dam, in one, in one particular case, can, can weaponize water uh, by essentially um, controlling it um, in a way that increases their leverage over either local populations, basically they're, they're withholding water from, from people who need it, uh, and also increases their leverage against their adversaries, um, in some cases a government, but also international coalitions, for example. And so, um, so yeah, water uh, and attacks on water can be weaponized. And so this issue has a, a, an overwhelmingly destabilizing effect, not just for the communities and the, the countries that it actually affects directly, but for the, the world at large. And I'm also thinking about the migration that yeah. this then leads to. There has been research showing that the migrants that are showing up at the U.S. borders from Central America, some of that may be triggered by climate change, where it's farmers who are finding year after year of deepening drought that is beginning more and more to look like not a temporary condition, but the new normal. And they, without support to change their livelihoods, without support to figure out what new crops to grow, you know, new economic activities, they don't have as many choices as they need, and they end up migrating. Yeah, and, and do they change. have the funding that they need to mitigate the effects of climate change? I do think there needs to be some kind of major effort by industrialized nations uh, to invest uh, in both reducing emissions so that we avoid some of the worst security consequences of climate change, but also in investing in climate resilience, um, including in those places that are most vulnerable uh, to, to conflict and instability. And so, and I think as to your point about, is it in, in, in our interest or in the interest of developed countries? Uh, it is, not, not only because climate change impacts are coming home, uh, but also it's, a, it's potentially a strategic benefit for countries um, to support you know, their partners, their allies, and prospective partners and allies in the world in their, in their climate resilience as a way of just maintaining their influence and leadership in the world. And I think the U.S. Is, it runs the risk of falling behind some other major developed countries in this context. You, you mentioned the U.S. and the Pentagon, which uh, called climate change, quote, a national security issue in its most recent January report to Congress, emits more greenhouse gases through its operations throughout the world than entire countries like Portugal and Sweden. Does that surprise you? If it were ranked uh, as, as a country, it would actually be the world's 55th largest contributor. I have to say I'm not surprised because I have been involved in this issue for quite some time, but I know that a lot of people would be. Um, and I also know that you know it's important to realize that there are solutions that these places that are being affected by climate change are coming up with. I mean, Bangladesh is a good example where the country has shown real leadership in not just sitting there being a victim of the changes it's seeing, but figuring out what to do about it. But the funding is an important part of it. Solutions are there, but it will take both increased finance, but also political will to scale up the things that we're learning can work. And so speaking about solutions, how much political will is it going to take to stop 
the subsidizing of the fossil fuel industry, which globally runs to the tune of $5.2 trillion a year. Well, I think it'll take an extraordinary political will, uh, but it can be done. There's real consensus over the fact that climate change is a security problem that the U.S. has to deal with across partisan lines. So we've seen over the past couple of years um, real bipartisan support, and you, you rarely hear about this, for, uh, for provisions, for example, in the National Defense Authorization Act, identifying climate change as a major threat. Uh, yeah, this the is, president doesn't seem to be on board. Well, the president signed this bill in 2018, the National Defense Authorization Act, that says climate change is a threat to national security. Did the president know that? That, that was in the bill. I mean, that's probably uh, questionable, but um, but clearly there's bipartisan support. The president is pushing against that, but I think it's, it's a losing battle. And I think uh, we're going to be seeing more and more attention to this issue and more political will as the years come. Francesco Femia and Rebecca Carter, thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. And so while a climate of denial and neglect still prevails in many of the world's wealthiest nations, for many in the developing world, climate change is not a hoax or a distant danger. The big polluters can continue to ignore the plight of the world's poorest and the destabilizing long-term impact of climate-induced conflict at their own peril. From me, Rida Fakhri, and all the team here in Washington, thanks for watching. <laughs>